Good day. Today we're going to be looking at some of the phonetic features of Australian English, how they got to be that way, and then comparing them to accents from other parts of the English speaking world. Now, who am I to be talking about Australian English, you might ask? But don't worry, I've studied under some of the masters of Australian pronunciation. Neighbours, Home and Away, the Sullivans, and none other than Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. I think one of the most striking features of Australian English is the vowel in the word price. As in, I like Thai rice. Now, people have described this as being like O-I, the vowel in boy, but it isn't. If you compare that to other accents that actually do have an O-I like uh, vowel, you get stuff like um, Birmingham in the UK. I like Thai rice. The West Country. I like Thai rice. Ireland. I like Thai rice. And East Anglia. I like Thai rice. So the Australian diphthong starts at the back of the mouth, the kind of vowel that you'd get in Cockney palm. R, 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 I, I. Now it might be some rounding, but it's definitely not oi. When we look at accents of English in other parts of the English speaking world, we're normally talking about big regional differences. That's not the case in Australia for reasons that we'll look at a bit later. Instead, there's more of a class based distinction between cultivated Australian, general Australian and broad Australian. It's the general kind we'll be looking at today. Another feature that really stands out to me and says, oh, yeah, that speaker's Australian is the last vowel in comma which is much more open and further forward in the mouth than the equivalent in RP, comma, or indeed general American, comma. Is that a new hamster? The old one was better. It matched the sofa. This also happens in the way that many people say the diphthong in near. So you get, is there any good beer near here? A question I get asked a lot is, how come there are so many different accents within a very, very small space in England, whereas a country the size of Australia is pretty homogenous. Well, there are several reasons for that. Firstly, people have only been speaking English in Australia since 1787. All of the people who arrived there as colonists came in through a small number of ports and communication between those ports by ship was quite constant. Meanwhile, they were pretty cut off from the mother country. People also very quickly formed a strong local Australian identity. Of the 1,373 people who landed in Sydney Cove in 1787 as part of the first fleet, 20 were babies who'd been born on the way. They joined other kids as the first speakers of Australian English. The English they were exposed to was a mixture of working class accents from all over England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. There were 15 officials and passengers in the first fleet, and we can imagine that they spoke some precursor to RP. Everybody else was split 50-50 between convicts and their families, and crew members of the ships, and marines, and their families. And all of those people would have had regional working class accents. Accent levelling started to take place. And that's a process where you kind of shave off the rough edges between each other's accents and you kind of get, you end up with what you have in common. Predominant accents among that group of people, the first colonists, were from the southeast of England and London, so Cockney. A lot of features come through into Australian English today, but it's also a picture of the stage of development that Cockney had reached at that stage in the mid to late 18th century. So the features I mentioned before, the price vowel, so that sentence in Cockney would come out as, I like Thai rice. And also that feature of the vowel in comma. Is that a new hamster? I like the old one better. It matched with the sofa. non rhoticism is a feature that was developing in southeastern England at the time. That means not having R's at the end of syllables. So no R sounds after vowels or before consonants. Most parts of North America, which were colonized earlier, 
still have as in words like park and star. But some parts of North America, especially ports on the East Coast, were in constant contact with England for a lot longer, so they picked up that tendency to stop pronouncing the R's. It was already advanced enough for Australia, New Zealand and other parts of the Southern Hemisphere to go along with that trend. So Australian English today has words like start and park. It also has the feature of intrusive R, so you get phenomena such as law and order and Australia is a nice place. On the other hand, there are features that we very strongly associate with London English that hadn't happened yet when people started living in Australia. These include TH fronting. So in London, I think I thought I heard you cry. Whereas in Australia, I think I thought I heard you cry. And H dropping. A hundred hungry hogs hurled hoops at the haughty herons. An hundred hungry hogs, old oops at the old errands. And T glottalization. Betty Burton bowled better the later she started, as opposed to Betty Burton bowled better the later she started. In that last example about Betty Burton batting better, you'll notice that we get T voicing between vowels or flapping between vowels, which we also hear in North American English. Another huge change that was happening in London at the time was the split between trap and bath. So that R vowel in some words stayed the same, but in others moved further back and got longer. So you got a difference between words like trap and words like bath. Or in Cockney, it was trap bath. At the time, this was looked down on by posh people and didn't really become accepted until the 19th century. People took this change with them to Australia, though, even though it was only halfway through. So you get some words in Australia that match the Southern English pronunciation with the long vowel and others that don't. This also varies across the country. So this is one area in which there is less homogeneity than in other features. South Australia was colonised just that little bit later. So that's why there's more match between those words that have the R, the palm vowel, in South Australia and the south of England. So while people in Hobart, Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney are dancing the night away, Adelaideans are having a nice dance. Now, that short A ah sound is similar to Cockney, but the long A ah is further forward in the mouth and more open than the Cockney R. Ah. Australian English displays what's called goose fronting whereby the vowel in goose is pronounced quite far forward in the mouth and in Australia is actually a diphthong. Would you say boo to a new blue goose or would the goose say boo to you? This is in contrast to Cockney, which has quite a back pronunciation. Would you say boo to a new blue goose or would the goose say boo to you? RP, would you say boo to a new blue goose or would the goose say boo to you? We also hear this in Manchester. Would you say boo to a new blue goose? Or would the goose say boo to you? Scotland. Would you say boo to a new blue goose? Or would the goose say boo to you? And Northern Ireland. Would you say boo to a new blue goose? Or would the goose say boo to you? Stressed I is often pronounced as schwa in Australian. So we get, especially in grammatical endings like ES uh, plurals and EDs for past. So buses, wanted, needed. We also hear this in the unstressed versions of words like it and is. Is it dead? Other examples are rabbit, Alice and Martin. Stressed I is much higher in the mouth than the Cockney and RP varieties. So you get fish and chips. And this is in contrast to the New Zealand accent, which is very similar to Australia and often confused with it but where even the stressed I comes out as schwa, so fish and chips, as opposed to Australian fish and chips. L's are very dark, even pharyngealized, so pronounced with some tension in the throat, across the board in Australian English. So words like like, blink, pull, milk, etc. Sometimes you get the kind of L vocalization that you hear in London with words like pool and milk. Um, but this again tends to be heard more in parts of the country that were colonized later. The goat vowel 
is an amazing thing in Australian English, and it's undergone some changes recently. In closed syllables, it's O. I wrote about goats on my boat. But in open syllables, it has a diphthong that moves forward in the mouth, ending in something similar to the French U. So go, don't go. There's an even more recent phenomenon among young people that started apparently in South Australia, whereby that open O ends in a bunched R. There's an excellent video by Dr. Jeff Lindsay that I'll link to in the comments. Oh, and by the way, a quick note for my fellow Americans. The familiar term for an Australian is an Aussie, not an Aussie. Using a nickname implies a certain degree of familiarity. So if you then get it wrong, it really blows that out of the water. Imagine if you were trying to pass yourself off as a big Rolling Stones fan, but kept calling Mick Jagger Mike Jagger. What's that, Skip? No, I'm not going to tell people to subscribe and click the bell icon. They know if they want to see more videos, that's what they have to do. Anyway, do you know that kangaroos don't make that noise? Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this video, you'll love this one, which is all about the English accents used in England.